Mr. Chancellor, it is my extreme pleasure to present to you Dr. Edwin Fuller Torrey, known as Fuller to everyone, a passionate advocate for mental illness care and research and a pioneer of modern psychiatry. A McGill alumnus from this exceptionally distinguished uh, class of 1963, Dr. Torrey has led a, a, a field filled with scholarly achievements and contributions to society. His research has focused on the biological basis of mental illness, and particularly, in particular, highlighting the neurological basis of schizophrenia and other serious mental disorders. Dr. Torrey is, however, best known for his involvement in public education and advocacy. He's been a passionate advocate for the cause of mental illness, fearless in his commitment to stand up for individuals affected by diseases that rob them of the ability to stand up for themselves. In 1989, he founded the Stanley Medical Research Institute, a not-for-profit organization which has supported more than $550 million in psychiatric research in over 30 countries since its inception. In 1994, he created the Stanley Brain Collection, the most widely used such collection in the world for the study of diseases such as schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, and other mental illnesses a tireless and energetic advocate for improved patient care and mental health. In 1998, Dr. Torrey founded the Treatment Advocacy Center in the United States, dedicated to eliminating barriers to the timely and effective treatment of severe mental illness. A prolific and influential writer who has penned 21 books, Dr. Torrey has received two commendation medals from the United States Public Health Service, as well as numerous, numerous awards and tributes. Through his enduring dedication to mental health care and public service, Dr. Fuller Torrey is an exceptional role model for all health practitioners and serves as an inspiration for physicians, scientists, activists, and students. Monsieur le Chancelier, je vous présente le Dr. Edmund Fuller Torrey afin que vous lui décerniez le diplôme de doctoresse et sciences honoris causa. Ladies and gentlemen, it's now my pleasure to invite Dr. Edwin Fuller Torrey to deliver the convocation address. Dr. Torrey. Thank you all very much. I'm very honored to be here. It was one of the great days of my life when I got my degree from McGill here. And I don't remember anything that anybody said in these talks. <laughs> when I graduated from the university, John Diefenbaker, then the Prime Minister of Canada, was our graduation speaker. And he went on and on and on. It was a hot day, endlessly. <laughs> and I want to reassure you that I'm not here for revenge. <laughs> it's actually worse than that. I'm here to give you advice. Why you would want to hear any advice from someone who can remember World War II, who remembers when there was no television and does not own an iPhone, I have no idea. So this may be a good time to check your messages. <laughs> I have five brief pieces of advice. Number one is don't pay any attention to old people who offer you advice. <laughs> Ignoring them was one of the best things that I did. I was told when I graduated from university that I should attend the, the medical school, prestigious American medical school that my colleagues in the university all aspired to go to. And I said, no, I want to go to McGill. And he said, that's wrong. You're going to ruin your medical career. He was wrong. Uh, McGill was one of the best choices I've made in my whole life. When I graduated from McGill, I took an internship. <laughs> Thank you. 
when I graduated from Yale, I took an internship at the Kaiser Hospital in San Francisco, which at that time was known as a socialist and perhaps even communist organization because they had prepaid medical care. I was told at that time by a prestigious Boston physician who had come up to lecture to our class that I was doing the wrong thing. I should go to his institution in Boston because that's where the world really began on it. He was wrong. When I started at the National Institutes of Mental Health, 1970, I was told to stop writing these awful memos, including things like recommending that people who were trained with public funds should have some kind of public service obligation. That was absolutely unheard of. And I was told that I would never have a nice career, a respectable career, certainly not an academic career, if I persisted in doing these terrible kinds of memos on it. He was wrong. Look at these nice robes. <laughs> there is no right career path. Decide what you want and make your own path. That's the most important thing. Number two, don't be afraid to be a real doctor or your other medical things. <laughs> I learned this very early on. I was a Peace Corps physician in Ethiopia for two years. And in the first month I was there, I was asked to see a Somali boy who had come over the hill with his sheep and been mauled by a lion with a very nice scar, very nice open right down to his ribs across his chest. And I tried to remember which lecture we covered here with lion mauling. <laughs> realized I probably wasn't there that day, but I did realize <laughs> that I had had very, very good medical education here, so I knew what to do, and we did it. A few months later, I had to do an emergency C-section using open drop ether anesthesia. I realized that that had not been covered by our OB lectures either. But if you got the basic education, which we really had here very, very well, uh, the woman lived miraculously, and it worked out well. Number three, don't lose your medical skills. Maintain a clinical base, no matter what you're doing, even for just a half day a week. I have seen so many of my colleagues who worked hard to become physician lose those skills. As a psychiatrist, I've been embarrassed by many of my colleagues who, when asked to help draw a tube of blood, suddenly remember that they have a conference call they have to attend. I mean, some of them act like you ask them to do open heart surgery on it. Uh, in 1972, I helped organize an American group that went to Moscow to find out what they were doing in schizophrenia research, and I met at that time the Minister of Health for all of the Soviet Union. He was a surgeon. He was still operating a half day a week. I thought that really is very, very commendable. And I will say that as my American colleagues rise to higher positions, they give up their clinical responsibilities. And that's one reason, a major reason, why American medical care is so poor and so poorly organized. Number four, be an advocate as well as a physician. And whatever type of medicine you practice, be an advocate for your patients in addition to providing their care. The two should go together and you should find the combination very personally satisfying. What do I mean? Among my McGill classmates, Dr. Nicholas Steinmetz, who's here today, in addition to being a pediatrician, led efforts to combat poverty and child abuse in Quebec. David Boyd, who placed the hood over my head, in addition to being a surgeon, organized the trauma centers in the United States on it. Thus, in the morning, you can do lumbar punctures and skin grafts, and in the afternoon, you can write letters to the editor, meet with the mayor's health advisor, and send information on dishonest pharmaceutical industry drug trials to the media. The number of possible advocacy efforts and projects is endless. Lead in paint or drinking water, McDonald's and diabetes, concussions in sports, yes, gets, let's get fighting out of hockey, car safety, gun control, needle exchange, on and on and on. No matter what part of medicine you're in, there's a lot of advocacy needs to be done, and you'll be a much better physician if you do some of it. Finally, don't complain. <laughs> As a physician, you have one of the best jobs you can have, an honored and intellectually rewarding position. You can spend your day pondering interesting clinical problems, making feel better, making people feel better, occasionally even saving lives. 
I get very tired of my colleagues complaining that they get paid too little. If you want to make a lot of money, do something else, really. Medicine's not a good place for it. Or that the government is interfering with your profession. Compared to most other jobs doctors have, it's easy. How would you like to be a plumber? I mean, they really deserve to get paid a lot. Or worse yet, a lawyer. <laughs> that's all the advice I have. You will have forgotten it all by tomorrow, and that's OK. People like myself who offer advice usually do so because it makes us ourselves feel better. La Rufo Show in his maxims in 1665 said, quote, old men like to give advice in order to console themselves for not being able any longer to set bad examples. <laughs> Congratulations once again. I wish you all a career in medicine as satisfying and exciting as my own has been. Thank you. <laughs>